It's Sunday morning, and we're in a study on the book of Revelation and on prophecy. The Bible teaches that at the end of time, and this is pretty much uh, a common agreement among all scholars and theologians, the Bible teaches that at the end of time, that there will be a great war against Israel by the nations that surround Israel. It looks like we're building up for this great slaughter, this onslaught. And only Jesus will rescue Israel. Now people will say, Jim, I thought you said that Israel was spiritual. It is. In the event that it, literal Israel believes God, and I believe there will be a remnant, they will believe God through Jesus Christ and they will believe the truth. They will not believe Jerry Falwell's truth or they will not believe Billy Graham's truth or Kenneth Copeland's truth. They'll believe the truth of the Bible. They'll believe predestination. They already know that Christmas is pagan and Easter is pagan. They will believe in a daily cross and self-denial. They'll believe in the Jesus of the Bible, not the other Jesus that Paul spoke of in 2 Corinthians 11 and 4. They'll believe the truth. And the only way Israel can come in is through Jesus. Jesus said, no man comes to the Father but by me. Now, we're talking about, like I said, Revelation. And I want us to go back to the 20th chapter of Revelation. And I'm going to talk to you this morning about Gog and Magog. Gog and Magog. And I'm going to define these words once again. The only people that I have found a satisfactory answer to these words Gog and Magog is the Cyclopedia of Biblical, Ecclesiastical, and Theological Literature by John McClintock and James Strong. I've got the International Encyclopedias. That's a four-volume set. The McClintock and Strong is a 12-volume set. I've got the Schaff Herzog. That's a 12-volume. I've got the uh, Hastings, which is a 13-volume set. And I've got the Smiths, which is a four-volume set. I've got the Isidore Singer, which is a 12-volume set of the, of the Jewish encyclopedias. And I've got a 17 volumes of Judaica and many more. And that's a Jewish encyclopedia. Only one of them has a thorough understanding of who Gog and Magog is. That's the McClinic and Strong. Now, you'll, you'll find that McClinic and Strong is thorough on some things. But then whenever you get to start studying demons and spirits, which there's no such thing as demons, you're going to get your best understanding of, of what demons are out of the Hastings. McClinic and Strong doesn't have near what Hastings has. And what you look up in Hastings, you look up demons and spirits. And it'll tell you what demons and spirits were in Assyria, what they were in Babylon, what they were among the Christians, what they were among the Jews, what they were among the among the Japanese, what there were among the Egyptians, and you'll find an interweaving of demon, genie, fairies, totems. Totems are all over the world. The totem was an ancestor, and the totem was represented in the animal world, and if you had a totem that was that animal, you protected that animal, and you wouldn't let anybody kill that animal, and that's what the totem pole comes from. But the totems were among the fairies of the Celts, they were among the demons of the Jews. They were among the genies. Genie comes from the word gene. And they were among the genies of the Arab people. Now, I just simply said that to show you that there's a difference. Don't say one set of encyclopedias is better than the other. No one group of people doing one set of encyclopedias might, there might be 450 or 500 contributors and they'll all be theologians of sorts. So you're going to find... One man has something, another one doesn't have. That's why I suggest get at least two good sets of encyclopedias. If you can get the McClinic and Strong and the Hastings, those are magnificent, both of them. So, we're going to talk about Gog and Magog. Now, Gog and Magog is the, is the nation which is north of Israel. It's the same thing as Armenia. Here is the Caspian Sea. Here's the Black Sea. And this is, well, it was USSR. It's broken up into states. Right here between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea is Armenia or old Georgia. And then you've got Israel down here on the eastern end of the Mediterranean. I'm going to try to draw that up on the board that I've got here as we teach. But let's go back over 
And I'm, I've got so many things, I'm going to just pitch them to you. I can't get to everything and show you all of it. And I, this is a, going to be a scary message this morning. So if you get scared easy, you might want to leave early. Okay. All right, let's go to the 20th chapter of Revelation. 20th chapter. We're talking about there is a spiritual Gog and there's a literal Gog. Let me put this on the board. There's a spiritual, there's a spiritual, and a literal. There has to be. You'll see that as we go through this. Literal. And there is a spiritual Israel. Israel. And there is a literal Israel. But literal Israel, in order to go to heaven, they've got to come through Jesus. Jesus said, no man comes to the Father but by me. So there's a spiritual Israel and a literal Israel. Spiritual Gog and, a, and Magog and a literal Gog and Magog. And I want us to see here in Revelation, the 20th chapter, we're talking about Gog and Magog attacking Israel or attacking the church. Now, the 38th chapter of Ezekiel shows us that there is going to be a, some sort of a literal attack upon Israel and it's going to be by the Arab nations that surround Israel. You have something uh, among the Arab nations. It's called the Muslim Brotherhood. Muslim Brotherhood. And the men who are in charge of this brotherhood are what we call terrorist organizations. But as far as they're concerned, they're not terrorists. Because they actually believe they're right in doing what they do. You have Syria up here. Well, let me see if I can draw this up here. Uh, not real good. Here's, this is Mediterranean Sea. Then you go over here. This would be, this would be, uh, this would be Turkey. Turkey, and then you've got uh, the Strait of Hormuz up here. Over here, like so. Like this. And this is the Aegean Sea right here. And you got the boot of Italy over here. Italy's shaped like a boot. I keep saying the boot of Italy. It's because it's shaped like a boot. And then you're going over here. And you get over here and you get down to you down to Spain, and here's Spain. They called it Espana, Spain, and then you got you got France in here. Here's France. You got Germany up here, and Holland over here, or Netherlands. And then you got you got the uh, England here, and Ireland up here, across the sea, or connected up here in Scotland up here. Well, and Rome is right here. Then you've got, uh, when you come down, I got to have an awful big Africa. And this is the African coast, African coast, African coast, African coast. And Carthage is right in here, the Carthage Empire. And over here, you've got Libya right in here where Gaddafi was. He was right in here. This is Libya. And then you have, uh, this is Israel right here. Israel like so. This is Israel. And the only people in the Middle East, in that area of the world that God gave the truth to, was Israel. And the beast ruled all of this. Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. Persia, Greece, and Rome. They ruled the rest of the world. Now, this is Africa down here. Here's Egypt. Egypt. And here's the Nile going on down here. And Ethiopia down here. And here's the Arabian Desert. And this is where Moses leaves Egypt, comes out here, and goes to Mount Sinai. The Bible says Sinai is in Arabia, but we don't know the boundaries of Arabia back then. Could have been in what we call the Sinai Peninsula. Here's Israel. Well, over here, you have Syria up here. You have Syria. Syria. And directly above Israel, you've got what we call Lebanon. Lebanon. 
And Lebanon, this is the old land of, this is ancient Phoenicia. Or, during Bible times, it was called Sidon and Tyre. And that was one of the headquarters, one of the foundations of, of, uh, of Baal and Grove worship. And of course, Ahab, king of northern Israel, marries Jezebel, and Jezebel's father is Ethbaal, and he is the prince of Tyre there in the 28th chapter of Ezekiel. So, and when you say Tyre and Sidon, it's saying the same thing. <coughs> so Israel was polluted down into northern Israel. Ahab marries Jezebel, the daughter of, the daughter of Ethbaal, and they uh, start this pollution of Israel. And then their daughter, Athaliah, marries uh, Jehoram down here in southern Judah. That's, and of course, the nation was split into two nations because Solomon's apostasy. He fell away and went after, he married 700 wives and 300 concubines in the 11th chapter of 1 Kings. And when he did that, he started embracing their gods. And God says, and why Solomon did that is beyond me because he was a wise man and a righteous man. And he repented in his old age. So, so uh, Ahab's daughter and Jezebel's daughter marry Jeho uh, Jehoram, Jehoshaphat's son down here in southern Judah. And her name is Athaliah. And she takes this Baal and Grove worship down to southern Judah. And that is, that's the same system that Constantine later on brought in the church, sun and tree worship. And it, they renamed, he renamed, renamed it Christ Mass or Christmas and brought it into the church. Now, so you've got Syria here. You've got Jordan right here. This is Jordan. I'm not good at drawing Jordan very well. I mean, look at it. It's shaped like this. There's Jordan. This is Jordan. I'll just make it somehow like this. Like so. This is Jordan right here. This is Israel. Israel's right here. And Jordan is right here. Northern Jordan in the ancient world was called the land of Ammon. Southern Jordan was called the land of Moab. And Moab and Ammon were the two sons. Ammon was actually Ben-Ami. Ben-A-M-M-I. Ben-Ami was... Ben-Ami and Moab were the two sons of Lot's daughters when he left. Here's down below Israel. This is Israel right here, Israel. Down below Israel is the land of is Sodom. Sodom and the Dead Sea is right there on the border of Israel. So uh, they were leaving Sodom and they come into the land of Moab and his daughters took Lot up into a mountain and had sexual relations with him, not for the sake of sex, but because anyone who was a descendant of Abraham knew the promise of a Messiah, and all the women wanted the Messiah to come out of their womb. So that's why they did this, and this became the land of, later on, Jordan. It's the land of the Ammonites. In fact, you remember when David had his affair with Bathsheba, when he had his affair with Bathsheba, uh, they were at war with the Ammonites. David is down here in Jerusalem, and they were at war with the Ammonites up here. Well, then you get over here, and you've got, you've got uh, like so. This is like, this would be, that would be the Persian Gulf. This would be Iraq. What we call Iraq, here's the, Here's the Euphrates River coming down from the north. Here's the Tigris River coming down. Babylon is built on the Euphrates River. And the capital city of Assyria, which is northern Babylon, was built on the Tigris River. And that city was Nineveh. And that was the, the capital city of the Assyrians. Well, that's why God told Jonah and Nahum, who said, I am the burden of Nineveh, to go to Nineveh and cry out against that city. This was one of the most, without a doubt, the Assyrian Empire was the most butchering, barbaric bunch of people in the history of the world, and they were Caucasians. 
And I don't know why Caucasians think they're better than other people, but they do. And these were Caucasians, and they were Caucasians because right above Iraq is the Caucasus Mountains between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. Now, I have to paint this so we can see what Gog and Magog is about. And then east of that is going to be Persia. Now, Iraq is the same thing as Babylon or Babylonia. Babylon. Now, remember, you have a city of Babylon on the Euphrates River, and you have the Babylonian Empire, which is covering half the world, half the civilized world at that time. Well, then you've got, then you have over here Iran. Iran is the same thing as the ancient Persia. Persia. And Iran, uh, Persia went all the way over to Afghanistan and Pakistan and Turkestan and all the way to India over here. That was all Persia. Now remember, when Israel goes after Baal in the grove, this is Israel right here, right there. When they go after Baal in the grove, God says, I'll send sword, famine, pestilence, and I'll send the beast. Well, the sword, famine, pestilence came for 500 years while they were a nation under kings, First Samuel, Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. That's the history of Israel. They kept going after all these idol gods, these tree and sun gods. And when they went after that, God kept sending all of these plagues, sword, famine, and pestilence. Finally, he sent Babylon. He sent the Assyrians, which is a part of the Babylonian system. They're always identified with them. He sent Assyria in 722 B.C. to carry northern Israel away captive. And he sent, southern, he sent to southern Judah, Babylon, in 586 B.C. to carry them away captive. And they've been captive for 2,600 years until May 14, 1948, where they became a nation for the first time in 2,600 years. And the Bible says this is the generation that will not pass away till everything's fulfilled in Luke 21, 24. Now, we remember how God carried Israel away by the Assyrian Empire, which is up, here's the Caucasus Mountains, here's the, here's the Black Sea, here's the Caspian Sea. The Caspian Sea. And this goes up into what we call Russia. And this is Armenia. Or this is the old Georgia. Georgia. Georgia was over there before it was here. And then this is the, this is the Caspian Sea. Now remember, the, up here between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea, and in northern Iraq, is the Assyrian Empire. And their headquarters is on is in Nineveh on the Tigris River. Well, it, it was Assyria that came and carried northern Israel away. It was Babylon that carried southern Judah away. And then Persia overthrows Babylon when Cyrus, the king of Persia, marches down the riverbed. He, he, he uh, diverts the river out into the Arabian Desert, marches down the riverbed, overthrows Babylon, and... Then they rule there, Babylon rules, until 539, where the, the Persians, or you and I would say Iran, and Afghanistan and Pakistan, same thing as ancient Persia. They come in, overthrow Babylon, and then, then there arises a man out of Macedon. We call it Macedonia. And he's, that is Upper Greece. And his name is Alexander the Great. And Macedon up here is Thessalonica. And uh, you have uh, uh, Philippi. That, those are Macedonian cities. When Paul was at Troas, he heard the Macedonian call and said, come over and help us. Well, he goes over there and preaches to the Philippians and so forth. Well, this is the Aegean Sea right here. This is the Aegean Sea. A-G-E-A-N. Let me write that down. A GNC. And all of Paul's journeys was over here in this area right here. His three missionary journeys, he'd leave Israel, come up here to what we call Turkey, and then he would come over here and preach at Philippi and down here at Corinth and at Athens and so forth. And his final journey, he was carried up here to Rome to be beheaded. So, now, all right, 
what is it I haven't said? Okay, Greece overthrows Persia. Persia had already overthrown Babylon. So Greece becomes the conquering, the conquering empire. And then Alexander the Great dies. We don't know whether he was murdered or whether he died of poison or some kind of disease. I kind of believe like it was one of his generals. And he had four generals, Cassander, Lysacomus, Ptolemy, and Seleucus. And these four generals took over his, took over his uh, empire, and they divided it up, and Seleucus was the Syrian king. He conquered all this, got all this in here. He was always attacking Egypt, which was the Ptolemies, and he wanted that. Ptolemy was a general. Seleucus was a general. So was Castaner, so was Lysacomus. So uh, Seleucus tries to take over, and then Rome comes in, doesn't conquer Alexander the Great as such because he is the conqueror. He was five foot tall, by the way, and a homosexual. <laughs> For whatever that's worth. Carried his, carried his boyfriend with him into battle. Five foot. Of course, most of the average height of men back then was five, six or so. He was a little short for his time, not like he would be today. And he was probably the greatest general that ever lived, or one of the greatest anyway. Then, Rome overthrows or subjugates, put these in as subjects to Rome, and that's the beast with iron teeth, iron teeth, that overthrows all these other three horns or three powers, which would be Babylon, Persia, Greece. They overthrow them, and Rome was ruling in the New Testament. So the beast was here ruling in the New Testament, slaughtering the Christians by their millions. Now, I want us to look over here. I, now you got to, I hope you can kind of get a general picture of that, because the Bible teaches that at the end of time, all the nations around Israel, under, under ancient names, are going to attack Israel. Right now, we've got the Gaza Strip, which is right down here on the southwestern end of Israel. That's called the Gaza Strip. And in the ancient world, that was called the land of the Philistines. And before that, it was called the land of Anak. And the Anakims were the giants. And in that land there, uh, the Anakims the, were the ancestors of Goliath because Goliath was of Gath. He was a Philistine uh, champion. So you've got, uh, this is the Gaza Strip. And this is what they're fighting over. You've got the Gaza Strip right here. Let me put it a little larger over here. I'll erase Spain over here so you can see it. Okay? I'm sorry, Spain. But uh, it's the way it is. And th if this is Israel right here, you have the Gaza Strip right here. You have the Sea of Galilee is up here. Sea of Galilee. And then the Jordan River the source of the Jordan River is the Sea of Galilee. And it runs down south till it runs into the Dead Sea. And that's the, what is kind of an official border of Israel. When Israel comes out of Egypt, they go up here in the land of Moab, go just north of the, they go just north of the Dead Sea, cross the river and, and encamp at a place called Gilgal, and that's where they begin their conquering of the land that was given to Abraham uh, 600 years before. So you've got, what was I going to give you? Something. Oh, you've got, the, you've got the West Bank. You hear about the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. This is where you have to live if you're a Palestinian. The West Bank is on the West Bank of the Jordan River right here. Right there. That's called the West Bank. This is the Gaza Strip. This is where Palestinians have to live. Now, let me just say it one more time. Palestinians, for, for 700 years, 
The land of Israel was occupied by Arabs prior to May 14th, 14th, 1948. It was occupied by Arabs. And then for 400 years prior to uh, 1917, when Israel was liberated for the first time in 2,600 years, when they were carried away into captivity by Babylon, Persia, Greece, and then Rome, and subjugated, for the first time, they were freed in 1917 by the British forces, by the British Commonwealth, and they became a, they became a satellite province, a, a, a vassal nation. They were a part of the British Empire, or the British Commonwealth. And there was a, they were liberated from 400 years of misrule and slaughter and butchering by the Ottoman Turks. The Ottoman Turks, the Turks had been ruling Israel for 400 years. Well, they, there was a mandate issued. A man named Balfour, who was the, was the uh, ambassador after World War I to Israel, drew up what's called the Balfour Declaration, which was placing Israel under British rule. The, the Balfour Declaration was merely a statement saying that perhaps one day we'll make Israel a nation, but you're under British rule right now. And they had British troops in there from 1917 to 1948, and that's when they had to leave. Then they, uh, 1948, the mandate expires. Israel is declared a nation for the first time in 2,600 years. The Arabs have something they call al-Fatah. It means little girl. I don't know why they named it little girl. Little girl. It's an organization that says anyone who gets in the way of the expansion of Islam that you place yourself in jihad with the Arab people. And this would be the Muslim Brotherhood. The Muslim Brotherhood transcends all these see these red boundary lines those are boundary lines of states but all these are arab people and the arab people are ruled by a muslim brotherhood they are a militant people and in syria in syria you have hezbollah they're not only a terrorist organization they are. They build hospitals. They do things for their poor people. They actually believe in what they're doing. They're not doing this by saying, we're crazy. <laughs> they don't believe that. They believe they're right. They believe the land was stolen from their brother Arab Palestinians. So you got Hezbollah here. In the Gaza Strip, you have Hamas. H-A-M-A-S. That's the terrorist organization here. Then you have in you have in uh, Iraq, you have uh, Al-Qaeda. Yeah, I guess it is. And then over here in Afghanistan, you have Taliban. And these are men, these are organizations that more or less run the Muslim Brotherhood. And these borders, as far as they're concerned, don't count. These are all one nation and one people. When George Bush Jr., George W., when he sent troops over here and said, we're going to liberate these people and give them democracy, they don't want democracy because their religion is their government. Maybe the women want it, but they're not in charge. They don't count over there. That's why they cover their faces up and wear those, what do you call them, hookahs or something. Burkas, yeah. They wear those and they cover their faces up and they don't have any say. So they don't want democracy. The men run the nation. That's the Muslim Brotherhood. And the Bible teaches, it teaches at the end of time in the 38th chapter of Ezekiel that Turkey, Syria, Iraq, Iran, Jordan, Egypt, Ethiopia, Armenia, that they're all going to gather together and attack Israel. It looks like we're building up to that at the end of time. It looks like we're headed there, doesn't it? Huh? 
That's what it's talking about. It's not like this is something foreign in our minds. If you study with maps, you'll see these things. It's like the fellow that wrote us. Uh, uh, what was his name? Samuel. Samuel. Yeah, Samuel. He said, he wrote us from Israel. He said they had 3,000 uh, rockets coming in there. They've got, they had 30,000 troops on the Gaza Strip. They had 75,000 uh, in reserve, and now they're building that up more and more. This is not going to stop because when Israel was declared a nation May 14, 1948, they said, the Palestinians, they were made to go to one of these internment camps. I call them internment camps. They had to go occupy Gaza Strip or the West Bank. They could not. They had to either be here or here the rest of israel is for jews now you're going to have some you're going to have some arabs mixed in here if they're peaceful along the way but this is why they're bombing america this is why they're running anyone who sides with israel is going to be under jihad we've been in jihad and we haven't even known it not officially since 1948, May 14. The next day they were declared a nation. 250,000 Jews went to war with 45 million Arabs, May 15, 1948. And they were attacked from the north, from the north by Syria and by Lebanon with 10,000 troops. And they were attacked from the east with 10,000 troops. They were attacked from the south with 10,000 troops. And Israel had 10,000 rifles with 50 rounds apiece. That's what they had and a few old artillery pieces. And they've been... Now, if you think this is anything but a miracle, it's nothing but a magnificent miracle. Even the, the 67 war of June 5th through June 10th, to say that God's not intervening in this is we very ignorant. The Sinai War of 57, the Six-Day War of 67, June 5th through June 10th, the entire, the entire Egyptian Air Force was destroyed. It's just minutes by jet to Egypt. The entire Egyptian Air Force was destroyed on the ground. They didn't get a plane in the air. This is how Israel is, everyone in Israel is in the army. All the men, all the women, everyone. And you have to serve uh, two years, I believe it is, yeah, two years. And you have to be serve if you're a woman. You've got to put on that uniform and get out there and fight in the battle. This is a matter of life and death. Now, I wanted just to see some of this so you'll understand what's going on. All of these people, according to the Bible, at the end of time are going to attack Israel but when you see this in Ezekiel, the 38th chapter, they have different names. I'll go into it, but Turkey is called Meshach. Meshach. Tubal is over here in Armenia. Tubal is, you have Tobolsk, Russia right here, right in there. And Togarma And the Bible says all of these are going to rise and God says I'm going to cause them to come down and come up to Israel. And the reason it says come up to Israel is because Israel has a higher elevation. Jerusalem has a higher elevation than anybody else in this area. And Ethiopia is going to, all of these people are going to band together. Uh, uh, Tyre and Sidon, Persia, Babylon, and they have different names for them, Togarma, Meshach, Tubal, and we'll go into all of them as we get in the 38th chapter. At the end of time, all these people are going to attack Israel. It looks like we're headed towards that. I don't know when it's going to be, but it's going to be. This is not going to stop over there, and only God will rescue them, and they can't be rescued unless there's a remnant that comes and believes Jesus Christ. They can't go to heaven because they believe in Jehovah, because Jesus said, no man comes to the Father but by me. You can't go to God except through Jesus. Now, let me just show you. 
and I, sometimes I don't know exactly how to show you all of this. There's so much to it. But look back over here, the 20th chapter of Revelation. Let me get me a drink of water. Without studying with maps, you're not going to see this when you realize what this is about. Now, let's go back over here to Revelation 20. We do not believe in a thousand-year reign here. It's not the word thousand. We see Satan is bound for a thousand years. The word is kilia. It means 2,000 or more. It's plural. 1,000 was singular when talking in the increments of a thousand. Kilia is plural, 2,000 or more. There was no zeros in the, in the, in, among the Greeks. They used Roman numerals. And any multiple of 10, 100, or 1,000 was a form of the original number, and one was not even a number. They said that one was a generator of numbers, and they didn't start counting until they got to two. If you got one person there, you don't say, all right, men, count off, and you got one guy there. You can see who it is. It's one guy. You count one, two. They said two was the first number. So if you have plural, you have 2,000. So the millennium is not millennium. Mill anna means 1,000 years. It's 2,000 years from Acts 2 until the end, which is about 35 A.D. Now, all right. Now, we see at the end of this thousand years, which is the end of time, we see some things happening. I'm going to come back and go through this more thoroughly. Look here in, uh, in verse, verse 5. But the rest of the dead live not again until the thousands, or 2,000 years was finished, this is the first resurrection. If there was a thousand years, actually, after this is all over, then we wouldn't go to meet the Lord in the air till the thousand years is over. But we're going to go at the end of the two thousand years. Then he says, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. And they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him, a thousand years or two thousand years. We're reigning with Christ right now. We are the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is in you. And kingdom of God was a term for Israel. And those that walk according to a new creation, peace be on them and upon God's Israel. And we are God's Israel who serve God in truth. Our faith is in Christ and we have no confidence in this flesh in Philippians 3 and 3. That's God's Israel. We're circumcised of the heart. So there has to be a spiritual Israel, and I believe there's a spiritual Gog and a literal Gog and Magog. Now, let me read this. When the, when the 2,000 years is finished, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. He's going to be locked away from the church where he can't deceive the nations. Nations is the word ethnos. It means Gentiles. And there's a group of Gentiles, which is New Testament church or spiritual Israel, and we won't be able to be deceived, but at the end of time, there's going to be a falling away there in 2 Thessalonians 2, uh, 2 and 3. There's going to be a falling away of the church. The church is going to fall away from truth. We're there, aren't we? Then the church don't believe in predestination. They do in Christmas and Easter. They don't believe in the daily cross. They don't believe in death to self. They don't believe in self-denial. They don't believe in being hated by the world. They believe in being popular and having a nice Jesus. That's the other Jesus, the other spirit, the other gospel, 2 Corinthians 11 and 4. Now, let's continue reading. And Satan shall go out to deceive the ethnos, the non-Jews. The, why is he going to, who is he going to deceive? Not the ones that have never believed, but the ones that are believing the church which are in the four quarters of the earth. Four quarters means all over the world, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle. Now, this will be the persecution of the church. The number of whom is, is the sands of the sea. And they went upon the breadth of the earth, encompassed the camp of the saints, which is the church, not the Baptist church, the Catholic church, the church of Christ, the assembly of God church, the ecclesia, the called out of God, the righteous, the righteous elect of God. About, and the beloved city, I keep saying, that word beloved is the word agapao. Agape. Agape is walking in the commandments of God. That's one of the words loved. The other is the word phileo. This word here, agapao, is the verb form 
Agape is the verb form of agape, and agape is walking in God's commandments, 2 John 6. This is agape that we walk after His commandments. So the ones who are walking after the commandments of God, that's who Gog and Magog are going to attack. It has to be the church here, doesn't it? Because if literal Israel is not believing God, they're not the church until they begin to believe God, and I believe there will be a remnant that believes God. God wouldn't be protecting Israel with all these magnificent wars and causing them to conquer. There's only about four and a half million people to five million people in Israel, and they're surrounded by by 200 million Arabs. Can you see that? It's in, What they are, they are a nuclear power, and they're like Mighty Mouse sitting down here in the middle of a bunch of cats. And they're afraid to come over and attack Mighty Mouse because they have got... Only God knows how many missiles they've got in underground silos. I asked our friend, I said, if, I said, if a missile is down under a great big huge boulder and they punch the button, what's it going to do to that boulder? He said, it'll thump it away just like it's a pebble. It'll go to its apogee and it'll start shooting out maybe 20 warheads. They don't want to attack Israel. The consequences will be devastating to the Arabs and Israel. It's, it's not something they want to do. It's not like they can just do it because Israel is so little. They may be little, but they are powerful. Now, so this has to be the spiritual Gog and Magog. It has to be attacking because God calls, in the 11th chapter of Revelation, he calls literal Jerusalem, Sodom, Sodom and Egypt, where our Lord was crucified. But he talks about the holy city earlier in that. And he says, we are the holy city. We are heavenly Jerusalem, the church. That's the holy city, isn't it? Hebrews 12, 22. So we're the holy city. So they're going to attack the beloved or the agape of God. This is what the, the spiritual Gog, Gog and Magog is a term for the enemies of God. And it had a literal meaning in the ancient world. And the land of God, Gog, G-O-G. I told a, a real estate agent one time, I was 43 or 44. And she was a church of Christ and she was 10 or 12, 14 years older than me. And I said, and I was talking about prophecy and she was trying to argue with me. I said, well, first of all, Gog has to attack Israel. She said, God has to attack Israel. No, not God. Gog. It's, she had no idea who Gog was. Zero. Now, we got Gog right here, don't we? Now, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured Gog and Magog as it attacks the holy city, not literal Israel, we have the holy city. Remember over there in Revelation, the third chapter. Look at that real quick. And then we're going to go back to the 38th chapter of... We're going to look at Gog and Magog. Look at the, set, the third chapter of Revelation. Revelation. And you have to remember, we are the holy city. We're heavenly Jerusalem. The church. Now, in the third chapter, in verse 12. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar. Remember, overcome is merely the verb form of victory. Got to remember that. You've got, you got nouns and verbs in the Greek. You have a noun, and then you have a verb form of the noun. Overcome is the verb. Overcome is the verb. And victory is the noun. Is the noun. Victory is the word Nike. Overcome is the word N-I-K-A-O. The word endings are changed. This is the stem of the word N-I-K. A-O and E makes the difference in the verb and the noun. Now, then he says, He that has victory, and faith is the victory that overcomes the world in the fifth chapter of 1 John, right? Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is 
New Jerusalem, heavenly Jerusalem, the church. That's who the, spirit, the, the evil spiritual Gog and Magog will attack, which cometh down out of heaven, same words as Revelation, the 21st chapter there, those first couple of verses, and I will write upon him my new name. Look over here in Hebrews. Look in Hebrews, the 11th chapter. Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11. Look here in verse 8. By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place, which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out not knowing whither he went. By faith he sojourned in a land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise, for he looked for a city, looking for a city, it's an old gospel song, which have foundations, whose builder and maker is God. That's the heavenly Jerusalem. He is looking for the church. That's who he's looking for. Now, let's go over here and look at Ezekiel, the 38th chapter, and see what this is about. What's going on right now is building up towards the end. I know young people don't want to hear this, and I know it's hard on you. It's kind of like changing air. You can't change air. It's air. You can't change the facts. They're the facts. This is why we need to be looking to Christ. He's our hope. He's our blessed hope. And that's what we should be looking for. Now look here in Ezekiel. If you can find your way to, to Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel. Ezekiel, the 38th chapter. We found in the 37th chapter, we found God bringing Israel back from everywhere they were scattered. This is the Valley of Dry Bones. That's a picture of predestination where God says, you, you preach to these dead, dry bones, Ezekiel, and I'll bring a bone to his bone. I'll bring the head bone connected to the neck bone, the neck bone connected to the shoulder bone, the shoulder bone connected to the backbone. That's where that comes from. And it's a gathering of Israel at the end of time into one body. And God says, I will breathe life into them. You preach to the dead. And that's what we do. We go out here and preach to the world. And those that are God's dry bones will rise. Will resurrect in Christ. Then he's talking about the destruction at the end of time. Now let's read here. Chapter 38 verse 1. The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land, of, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. Let me give you something here. Let me read to you one more time. This is out of McClinic and Strong. I said they have the best on Gog and Magog I've ever read. I've read everybody. I've even read out of the Catholic Encyclopedia. I've got that. And they say the same basic things as the international, the same basic things. as. What's amazing is the Catholics are condemning themselves. And they don't even know it. But Catholic Encyclopedias are an excellent set of books. It's a big, this many volumes. Anyway, I think it's 12. Something like that. Anyway. Now, but let, me, let me put this on the board one more time. I'll put it over here where Israel is. Everything that's going on right now is about the end of time. There's going to be... Israel will fall by the edge of the sword and led away captive into all nations and Jerusalem will be trodden down to the Gentiles until Gentile rule is done. And that happened in 67. And God says in Amos the ninth chapter, I'll bring them back and once I bring them back, I'll never root them up again. And neither will anyone else. Now... Let me put Gog and Magog on the board so we can see who this is. It might take me a couple of three weeks to get through. Well, it'll take me more than that because I'll come back and review some so you can see it. Let me read this to you. Gog is derived. This is from 
Cyclopedia Biblical Theological and Ecclesiastical Literature. John McClinic and James Strong. Look up Gog. Look up Magog. Right there. If you got one of these, all you got to do is look it up. It's very, very good. Now let me read this one more time. Gog is derived from the title of ancient pagan heathen kings called Agag. Remember Agag? 15th chapter of 1 Samuel, the Lord tells Samuel, you go down to Amalek. Samuel's up here in Israel. And he says, the Lord tells uh, Saul to go down to Amalek, which is down here in the uh, Arabian Peninsula, Sinai Peninsula, and kill all the Amalekites. Men, women, children, king, everything. Why? Well, they didn't practice any of these. They had attacked Israel coming out of Egypt 200 years before, and they didn't practice any of these dietary laws or separations or quarantining. And they could pass disease real easy. God didn't want the disease coming to Israel. Well, Saul comes back up here to Israel after he goes down there and slaughters the Amalekites and he brings a bunch of the goats and the sheep and brings King Agag. Agag was a title not unlike Caesar or like the Solutions. You'd be called a Solution if you were Syria. Caesar was Julius Caesar's last name and all the other Caesars took that on. Well, that's the same way as Agag. And Agag was the king, and, S and Samuel said, didn't, we tell, didn't God tell you, didn't I tell you to go slaughter them, utterly kill everything, men, women, children, babies, everything? At least the babies would go to heaven, wouldn't they? He said, well, I did this, but the people made me do I'm just the king. They made me bring some of these sheep back because so we could offer sacrifice. And God said, it's better to obey than sacrifice. I don't need your rituals. Well, that was King Agag, and Samuel took a sword. Good Samuel, I hacked that king to the ground. I mean, he was, looked like beefsteak <laughs> after they went through the slaughterhouse. Gog is derived from the title Agag. That was the title. As the signification of Gog, it appears to mean mountain. Gog means mountain. A mountain was a capital city. A mountain was, a, was an authority. Was an authority. It appears to mean mountain. Caucasus. Caucasus. The Caucasus Mountains was between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. Over here it would be in here. This is the very head of the Assyrian Empire. Assyrians were Caucasians, by the way. They were slaughterers and butchers, and they invented scalping. They invented putting a man down on the desert, tying his hands down, putting a piece of rawhide on his throat, and letting it dry slowly and strangling him very slowly. They're the ones, Assyrians or Scythians, or Caucasians invented uh, putting a man, burying a man up to his neck in the desert, pouring honey on him and turning fire ants loose on his head. Not the American Indian. It was the conquistadors when they, went, when they hit the coast of San Salvador. They went in there and the Indians were peaceful and we taught them to want to slaughter because we went in there and started butchering them, taking their land. The conquistadors took these old Assyrian methods of torture and the American Indian adopted it and we got mad and called them savages because they were doing to us we had done to people thousands of years before. Assyrians, Caucasians. Caucasians are crazy, you know that? And I are one. <laughs> they're nuts. They think they're better than everybody. You know, I've wrestled with that for 25 or 30 years. Why? What is it in their heads? Do they think they're white and that makes them pure? That ain't white. That's pinkish tan. I believe they're called white people because... The word Lebanon is the word moon. Lebanon, we get the word Lebanon from that. It's one of the words for moon. It means white. And they were moon worshippers or white worshippers. I believe that's why they're called white people. I'm kind of ashamed to be a human. White, white or any color. How in the world can you have Black power, white power, red power. How can you have fleshly power when man is a worm? If you're circumcised of the heart, 
That's all that matters. You're doing the will of the Father. That's all that matters to me. Some of my best friends are Caucasians. <laughs> I just thought I'd say that. Now, as to the signification of Gog, it appears to mean mountain, i.e., Caucasus, or the Persian Co. Co. Or the ascetic, G-H-O-G-H, -G -H, Gog. And what they did is they hardened the consonant K to G. You get Gog from Caucasus. Caucasus. Gog. Can you see that? That's where it comes from. These are the Caucasus Mountains. This is the headquarters of the Assyrian Empire. Assyria was overthrown by Babylon, etc. Persia overthrows Babylon. Greece overthrows Persia. Rome subjugates Greece. That's the way it works. Now, mountain or even the classical name Caucasus originated from Kaukauf, K-O-H, K-A-F. Since Caucasus was the chief seat of the Scythian or the Assyrian people up here. So this is the land of God. These people settled in the Caucasus Mountains up here. That's it. That range right there is Caucasus Mountains. I'm not saying Caucasians are any worse than anybody else. It's just they got some attitude, you know. Everybody is sinners. There's none righteous, not one. There's none that understands. I know there's black people that are worthless and there's white there's white people that are worthless and there's red people that are worthless you're worthless if you don't have christ in your heart convicting your heart to live righteously aren't you i'm not favoring anybody i've just i have fought white people all my life <laughs> and you know why they're in charge they're ruining the nation i never have gotten along with them i got a i got a dvd title of it i don't get along with white people it's a good take isn't it? And I say in the, in the tape, if I lived in China, I wouldn't get along with yellow people because they rule over there. Well, whoever's in charge, me and Mary went on vacation out west, went on to those reservations out there, and it is, it is pitiful. It's terrible. It looks like a third world country. And so for reparations, the United States gives them casinos so they can gavel their money away and get drunk. That's what American Indians need, isn't it? It's a foolishness. And I asked a Hopi Indian lady, I said, who gets this money that comes into the tribes? She said, the chiefs. I'm afraid it works everywhere. Same thing, isn't it? She said, it doesn't bleed down to the, to the common guys who were the warriors in the tribes. The chiefs get it, and they get corrupted too. These people settled in the Caucasus Mountains directly north of Israel in upper Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia is all this area. It's the, it's the area of Iraq there. And Mesopotamia means between the rivers, between the Tigris and the Euphrates. That's what it means. Further north between the Caspian Sea and the Black Sea, up here in this area here. The hardening of the last sound H into a G, ga, ga, ka, ga, ga. Caucus. From co, K O H, K O H, Cog. Co seems to have taken place early when the name had already become that of a people. The other names, Magog and Agag, arose. Another explanation comes from the Pelvi, P E H L V I, Coca, meaning moon moon paul said we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities against powers against the rulers of the darkness of this world what ruled the darkness according to genesis the first chapter the moon they worship the lord moon in the form of a tree and upon the flags over here especially the turkish flag what do they have on there crescent moon and that was called Mene, or Allah. Mene meant the number, and the moon numbered the seasons. And Israel was indicted by God for pouring out drink offerings to Mene, an ancient title for Allah. He was the moon god, or the man of the moon. That's where they got it. 
They think that's a face on the moon. They think that's Allah up there. <coughs> Any number of the seasons. Because they prayed to the moon. Lebanon. And frankincense was a white powder called Lebanon. It was white. According to Renge, some of the Caucasian people called their mountains Gog. They called their mountains Gog. And the highest points they called Magog. Mountains were the seat of all the gods, weren't they? In the Olympian uh, pantheon of gods, over here in Greece, at Mount Olympus, the gods resided in Mount Olympus, didn't they? And our God resides in the mountain of Zion, and we're come to Mount Zion, heavenly Jerusalem. And all the gods was in a mountain, a capital city. Remember that? Magog means region of Gog, the second son of Japheth. Look at, look at Genesis 10 and 2. This is where we get this. Genesis 10 and verse 2. These are descendants of Japheth. Genesis, how much time do I have? Mike, I am not going fast enough. Good grief. I've got to get back here and read this. 10 and 2. Let's read 1 and 2. And these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Unto them were the sons born after the flood. The sons of Japheth. Gomer. Up here. Gomer. Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, and Meshech, and Tiras. And then he goes into the sons of Gomer. Here is my old table of nations map out of the 10th chapter. Here is Tiras up here. Tiras. Tiras. Here is Meshech here, right in the middle of Turkey, right about where Galatia was. Here is Tubal over here. Tubal. Here's Magog over here in the Syria area. Togarma is in this area. Uh, you have, of course, you got Put down here in Egypt. Put is Egypt. Cush is down here. Ethiopia is down here. Mizraim is down here. Now let me sh let's continue to read here. Now let's go back over. I got to read some in this 38th chapter of Ezekiel. So Magog. Meshach, Tubal, all these are, are the nations surrounding Israel under ancient names. It's the same thing as Turkey, Syria, Iraq, Iran. That's all it is. We're fixing to read about them. We're fixing to read how they're going to amass as one corporate unit and attack Israel. Now, what Mr. When you go into Kill and Deletes, they are commentaries written in 1866, and they're excellent commentaries on the Old Testament. And Mr. Kill and Delete say that these nations that are coming on the scene, all of the scholars say this has never happened before, and many of these nations that are coming on the scene have never appeared on the face of history. But they're here now under a different name. And it's going to be in an incorporated system that's going to attack Israel, and it'll be Gog and Magog. I believe at the same time, the church is going to be under attack by spiritual Gog and Magog. And we're under attack right now, aren't we? We're under attack. They, you, you people preach that predestination, you call preachers' names, and we don't like it when you call preachers' names. I've had people come here and leave because they don't like it because I call lying, false teachers' names from the pulpit. Stealing from people. Now let's read. The chief prince said, Son, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog. The chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. Now, if you'll notice, I've got, a, I've got a map of the empires. Meshach and Tubal. Meshach and Tubal was in every one of the empires of the ancient world. They were in every one of the empires. Here's the empires. The word chief is the word rosh. It don't mean Russian. It means head. 
Rosh. Means head prince. The chief prince is the head prince. Meshach and Tubal are in all the empires of the world. Between the two of them, they occupied a place in every one of the empires. The empires was the beast, wasn't it? So therefore, if they occupied in every one of the empires, then what would be the head prince of all the empires? It would be Satan, wouldn't it? That's the chief prince. There's satanic possession, not in somebody falling down going, ugh, ugh, ah, that's not it. It's possessing a man to possess people and to overthrow and to have power. Power is the most evil thing men seek after. That's the most evil thing. If he has power, the money and the women will be there. Won't it? And the women like to rush to a man that's got power. Don't care how ugly he is. Don't they? Then he says, and, say, and thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. I will turn thee back and put hooks in thy jaws. In that first chapter of Judges, God tells Israel to go in and conquer these, these people. You can see that. Look in Judges, the first chapter, real quick. Judges, first chapter. This is what he's talking about. This is God saying, I will do this. In verse 6, But Adam Nabizek fled, and they pursued after him, and caught him, and cut off his thumbs and his great toes. And Adam Nabizek said, Three score and ten kings, have, having their thumbs and their great toes cut off, gathered their meat under my table. What they would do, they would cut their thumbs off of some great king or great, great super general, and he could never wield a weapon again. Those generals could amass an army real fast. They were good. And they'd cut their great toes off and they had no balance and they couldn't fight no more. And they'd put them under their table. And they'd put hooks in their jaws and they'd run a rope or a chain up through their jaw, tie them under their table and throw them some bread once in a while. God says, that's what I'll do to you, Gog. I'll put hooks in thy jaws and I will bring thee forth Notice who's going to do the bringing. I will, God says. And all thine army, horses and horsemen. Now, if it were today, it would say tanks and it would say uh, hummers and it would say all kinds of, uh, of ordinances that they have, all the ordnance, which is the shells and the cannons and all. They use the, the writers using the terminology of the day. And horsemen and all them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. And here's what I'm going to bring. Persia, Iran, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan. That's who Persia is. East of Israel, coming from the east. Ethiopia, south of Israel, down here. I'm going to bring Ethiopia down here against Israel. And God says, I will bring them. This sounds like Brian Williams wrote this. Maybe Tom Brokaw wrote it. Sounds like the evening news sometime in the future. Persia, Ethiopia, Libya. I remember Libya real well. It's a little bay there. Just west of Egypt, Gaddafi was there, and I remember Ronald Reagan put a blockade across it. I remember that. Libya, with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer, Armenia. I'm going to put all these people together, and they're going to attack Israel, and I'm going to make them do it. Gomer, and all his bands, and the house of Togarma, Syria. Togarma is Syria. These are just, these, these are current names in the Middle East. That's called the Middle East because the Far East is over there in India, in China. And the Middle East means it's Mideast from the West. We're the West. Since everything began in the Sumerian 
valley or begin in Mesopotamia. They are Middle East. Far East is over here, and we're the West. The word Orient means East. The first, first Orientals were the Jews. Actually, they were down here in the Mesopotamian Valley, but these are the first Orientals. And we're Occidentals. We're Westerners. Then he says, Gomer and his bands told Garma of the north quarters and all his bands, all of the people that come with them, all of their allies are going to come with them. All of the, what if I said uh, the Muslim Brotherhood is going to come against Israel. It looks like we're building up to that. I don't know how long it'll take, a year, two years, five years, ten years, I don't know. But this is not going to stop because they believe that's their land. That's why they crashed. Those weren't crazy people that crashed the plane of the World Trade Center. They believe they, they actually believe they're right. They lived in the land for 700 years. Some old Arab farmer lived there. And after this 1948 declaration of Israel, they'd come in and say, you've got to leave this land, Mr. Arab. And in some Arabic dialect, he said, but I've farmed this for 50 years and my father farmed it for 50 before me. And my grandfather farmed it for 50. And my great-grandfather farmed it for 50. You're taking my home away? That's the way the Arabs feel. Do you, can you not understand? I'm not saying what's going to happen. I'm just saying there's no answer. And God says the land belongs to Abraham in Genesis, the 17th chapter. I give it to you for an everlasting covenant. And then it was given to Isaac in that same chapter. Then it was given to Jacob in the 28th chapter of Genesis. And <coughs> Jacob's name was changed to Israel in the 32nd chapter of Genesis. The land belongs to Jacob or Israel, but can you not see how the Arabs believe it belongs to them? They lived in it and possessed it for 700 years. I've said it so many times. I said it last week. If somebody come knocked on my door and say, Mr. Brown, you've got to be out of here Monday. I don't care if you did pay for this house over 30 years. It belongs to some Choctaws or some Cherokees under an old land grant of 1850. And you're going to throw me out? Can you see how the Arabs must feel? Is there any compassion? What's the answer? Distress of nations with perplexity, aporia, there is no answer. In a quandary, no way out. There is no way until Jesus comes. This is not going to stop. I don't care how many ceasefires they have. You're not going to make the Arabs go away and say, well, okay, you can have it. And the Jews ain't going to say, leave, leave and say, well, okay, you can have it. Ain't going to happen. People get in an argument over who something belongs to, and it, it ain't going to settle. Now let's keep reading. Be thou prepared and prepare for thyself, thou and all thy company that are assembled unto thee. Be thou a guard unto them. After many days thou shalt be visited, Israel, in the latter years, at the end of time, thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword. Israel has been under the sword for all these centuries. And they have been brought back from the sword. And Amos says when they're brought back, they'll never be carried away again. You can't just write this off and say, Israel's spiritual, and that's all there is to it. It is spiritual. And if a remnant comes, they have to come through Jesus Christ, through the truth, not accepting Christ, not praying a sinner's prayer, but believing God in obedience to his word through Jesus Christ. And after many days, these that are brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel... What are the mountains of Israel? Zion, where, is, where, Ju, where Jerusalem sits. These are God's mountains, which have been always waste. They've been waste for 2,600 years, but it is brought forth out of the nations. Do you know that no, I have read every kind of commentary in my library, and I've got hundreds of commentaries. In encyclopedias on this subject and I can't find anybody that says anything other than this has to be at the end with the great war that's going to happen in the Middle East and it's going to happen and we had the Gulf War we're down here on the Gulf of 
down here, the Gulf War. We have this, we're fighting over here in, over here in Afghanistan, the Taliban, and we're fighting over here, Al-Qaeda over here in, in Iraq or Babylon. And this thing is going on, and they all believe, they're all brothers, they're all Muslims. They say that land belongs to our brothers, and you stole it. They wouldn't have a whole lot to say if it wasn't for the Gaza Strip. If it wasn't for all the Arabs having their land taken away. You say, Jim, are you siding with somebody? No, I'm just telling you what it is. It just is. And nobody's going to get around this. What if you, you know the that, that Oh, gosh, we can't get into that right now. That's another whole subject. We'll talk about that in this series, though. I'm going to talk about the preterist in the series. It's ignorance. Then he says, Those that are brought back from the sword... And it's gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel, which have always been waste. But it is brought forth out of the nations. All over the world, Israel is brought back. It's just amazing they've retained their ethnic identity. And I've, as, as I said in this paper that I wrote, some Russian Jew, Assyria carried the Jews away first in 722. There's a river up here in, just in this Armenia area and it's got a little town in, on the river named Jericho. I wonder why. Because the Jews were carried up there. And up here is Moscow, straight up here, just above this. Well, some Jew, about 1917, wakes up, gets up. His wife is, see, he's a Russian Jew. His wife gets up. And they've been in captivity for 2,600 years. She's cooking breakfast. He looks over at her and says, Honey, I think it's time to go home. They start packing to move to Israel. And how could that be? They've never lived there before. It's just a... Uh, this is happening before. I've been preaching on prophecy since 1964. I started studying the 70 weeks of Daniel. And I'm watching happen what I've been saying for 40, 50 years. I'm, it's just happening right in front of my eyes. I'm going, wow. Let's continue reading. Thou shalt ascend. Ascend means to come up because Jerusalem has a higher elevation than the other places of it. You're going to ascend and come up to Jerusalem. You'll come like a storm all of Persia and Ethiopia and Libya and Gomer and Togarma. All the armies of these nations, which is Syria, which is Armenia, which is Turkey, which is Ethiopia. You're going to come against Israel. Thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land. There's going to be millions coming against them. Thou and all thy bands, all of your cohorts are coming with you. And many people with thee. Thus saith the Lord God, it shall also come to pass that at the same time shall things come into thy mind and thou shalt think an evil thought and I'll cause it, God says. And thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages. Unwalled means they don't have any protection. They're just a little nation there. Well, they say they're unwalled, but they have the protection of God. And they got all those missiles. But that's what Magog will say. And God, God will say, I'll go up. And they dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates. They can't stop us. You see, they had entire... Big, huge walls in the ancient world. They'd have 400-foot walls and a moat around it and a river running around it and through it. You couldn't get to them. It says, there's nothing stopping us from crossing those borders in Jordan and crossing the borders in Syria and going over there and attacking Israel. To take a spoil, to take a prey, to turn thine hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited and upon the people that are gathered out of the nations, upon Israel that's been gathered from all over the world which have gotten cattle and goods that dwell in the midst of the land. Sheba and Dedan, which is down here, down here on the Sinai Peninsula. Dedan's down here. 
sheep indeed, and the merchants of Tarshish with all the young lions. A young lion was a young warrior, a fighter. The young lions were the most fierce. If a young lion attacks you, he's going to kill you. There was a movie, Marlon Brando, The Young Lions, years ago. It was about some fighting Germans. Young lions all through the Scripture. David speaks of the young lions all through the Psalms. Soldiers. Just fierce fighters. And all the young lions thereof shall say unto thee, Art thou come to take a spoil? Hast thou gathered the company to take a prey? Are you come to take Israel away? To carry away silver and gold? To take cattle? and goods, and take a great spoil, all of these are going to come at once, and that has never happened in the history of the world. Has Assyria ever attacked Israel? Yes. Has Syria? Well, Ben-Hadad was always attacking, wasn't he? Has Lebanon? Yeah. Has Ammon? They were always attacking, but never as a corporate unit. And this is the only time this has ever happened, and it has never happened yet. It looks like we're building to it, doesn't it? You say, Jim, I don't want to hear that. I can't help it. I got to teach you. I know you got a life to live, but if you're ever going to serve God, it better be now. If you're ever going to live for truth, live for righteousness, it needs to be right now. Don't say, I want to sleep on Sunday morning. I don't want to come on Sunday night. I don't want to tithe. I don't. If we're ever going to get the message out, it needs to be now, doesn't it? Where was I? Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say unto Gog. Verse 14, Thus saith the Lord God in that day, in the day when I bring, I'm going to bring them up. When my people of Israel dwell safely, shalt thou not know it? How much time, Mike? Let me read this 3-2 here. I love this next part. And thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts. Gog, Assyria, Scythians, but it's going, to be a, it's going to be a spiritual attack on the church as well as a literal attack on Israel. I believe the two are going to come together at the end, the literal and the spiritual. Thou and many people with thee, all of them riding upon horses and a great company and a mighty army, and thou shalt come up against my people of Israel. Boy, that's sobering, isn't it? Ooh, we as a cloud to cover the land there's going to be so many of them it's going to be unbelievable there's that many of them right now it shall be in the latter days that ain't some time back years ago it's at the end of time every scholar agrees no one can find anyone oh they'll try to say it was Lydia it was this king or that king but we can't say that. That would be a guess. And they can't incorporate them all. Every commentary will say this has to be at the end. And that's what it says right here. It'll be in the latter days. I will bring thee against my land. I'll do the bringing. I'll put it in your mind. Gog, Syrians, Hassad, and all those crazy. Well, they don't think they're crazy, though. They believed they were right crashing planes into the World Trade Center. The reason they crashed the world planes in the World Trade Center is because Israel went after Bell in the Grove, which is the same sisters brought in the church and renamed Christmas, and they stayed in captivity for 2,600 years. And then we sided with Israel. Anyone who sides with Israel is in jihad against the Arab nations and the brotherhood of the Arabs. It's very sobering where we're headed. That He says, I will bring thee against my land that the heathen may know me. When I shall be sanctified in thee, O Gog, I'll be set apart in thee, Gog, before their eyes. Thus, you know, Gog is the same thing as the beast. Gog is the same thing as the man of sin. There'll be a leader in this system. Thus saith the Lord God, Art thou he of whom I have spoken in old time by my servants, the prophets of Israel? This 
man of sin, this king of fierce countenance in Daniel 8, who's going to be leader of the world beast system, which prophesied in those days many years that I would bring thee against them. This is not going to be the choice of God. It's going to be the choice of God. The living God, isn't it? That's who's going to do it. You think all this is going to stop that's going on right now? I tell people, you can forget about that. People talk about it. I say, I was talking to some rich guy down here at the store one day. I said, well, it's happening. And I said, you're 70 and I'm 73 and it don't matter. Me and you are going to be dead very shortly. That's a good way to witness to somebody, isn't it? He went, yeah, we, we've lived our life, haven't we? I said, that's right. I didn't have to say repent. You're going to die soon. I told a lady that's down at, down at Publix someday and she said, what do you mean I'm going to die soon? I said, you're 76. You've got to die soon. <laughs> you are kidding, aren't you? I love this next part. Verse 18, it shall come to pass... At the same time when Gog shall come against the land of Israel, saith the Lord, that my fury shall come up in my face. I'm going to get red in the face. Boy, how would you like to be on the receiving end of that? That's a frightening thing, isn't it? For in my jealousy, in the fire of my wrath, I have spoken surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel. Look here in Zechariah, the 12th chapter, real quick. I'm going to come back here. Look at Zechariah. Anyone who touches Israel touches the apple of my eye in Zechariah. And Zechariah also says something else here that I like. Zechariah 12. Apple is the word baba. It means pupil. And he says in verse 2 of chapter 12, Behold, I make Jerusalem a cup of trembling. When you, when you try to drink of this cup, you can't hardly hold it. You ever seen somebody try to drink a cup of coffee and they're real nervous? It's a cup of trembling. Unto all the people round about, around about Jerusalem, when they shall be in the siege, both against Judah and against Jerusalem, in that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people, all that burden themselves with it, shall be cut in pieces. And that's not only literal Israel. When they come to truth, that is the church. You mess with the church, God will cut you to shreds. Though all the people of the earth be gathered together against Jerusalem. Let's go back over here quickly to Ezekiel. When God comes against Jerusalem, Jerusalem, my fury will come up in my face for in my jealousy, verse 19, in the fire of my wrath have I spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel so that the fishes of the sea and the fowls of the heaven and the beasts of the field and all creeping things that creep upon the earth and all the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. How about that for a God? People say he's a nice, sweet, little, easy-going Jesus. No, he's not. He's a great, a mighty, and a terrible God. And the mountains shall be thrown down and the steep places shall fall and every wall shall fall to the ground. And I will call for a sword against him throughout all my mountains, saith the Lord God. Every man's sword shall be against his brother. I will plead. I will fight. I will rube. R-U-W-B. Fight. I will fight against him, against God with pestilence and with blood. And I will rain upon him and upon his bands and all those that come with him from Persia and Syria Babylon, Iraq, Iran, Ethiopia, Turkey, and upon the many people that are with him, an overflowing rain, a great hailstone, fire and brimstone. Thus will I magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations. They shall know that I am the Lord. It's kind of a scary thing, isn't it? Do you think this is going to stop over there? You can forget that. We're headed towards the great showdown between Gog and God. G-O-D and G-O-G. Not the easy going. No, that ain't no easy going, nice little Boy Scout Jesus with the Boy Scout sign. 
I love you. He's that God with comes back with eyes as a flame of fire. He's coming back in the fierceness of his wrath, in the fury of his face. I looked up one of those words that means for the nostrils to flare. Whoo, how would you like a God come after you like that? Do I have any time? One minute. I'm going to come back and we're going to go through the 39th chapter. And we're going to cover all these places. This thing in Israel is here to stay. Huh? Well, that's a long, long story. It's been more than we can get in right now, for sure. Well, let's uh, come on back next week and see if we can scare you some more. I hope we can. <laughs> it's a scary thing, isn't it? It's very frightening. Watch the news. This ain't going to go away. Forget that. If it goes away, throw your Bible away and go party. It's not true. At least tear out the 38th chapter of Ezekiel and the 39th chapter and rip out that 20th chapter of and rip out the uh, Revelation, rip out the 13th chapter of Revelation, the 7th chapter of Daniel, and uh, make our own Bible. yeah, make your own Jefferson Bible. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and for truth. God, wake the church up. Make us aware of what's going on. Mature the flock. Lord, if you have to scare the sheep, scare them, Lord, because you said the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge. Scare us, Lord. You've scared me. You've frightened me. You're nearly killing me for my wickedness in my wicked heart lord i repent sackcloth and ashes lord let me preach this word give me the truth so i can help the sheep to understand what's coming that we need to be prepared we need to make ready lift up our heads and look up for our redemption is drawing nigh lead us to your elect open up many doors for the ministry lord i'll say the truth i don't care what the cost lord you give me you've given me that we'll praise you for it all in christ's name amen